Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. And by Mysterious Tales of Loss and Woe and Other Jovial Stories, a new book by Truist Dunkworth. In a world of wonder, this is a book that encourages teens and preteens to think and be surprised. Look for it on Amazon.com. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. You're listening to episode 141 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Georgia Guidestones. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Be sure to stick around to the end of the episode, folks. Uh, we're we're going to be discussing your lists, <laughs> your choice for our most popular episodes from last year. We asked you for your feedback and what episodes you like most. And so we've compiled that, and we're going to have that at the end of the episode. But first, in June of 1979, a stranger drove into the small town of Elberton, Georgia. He stopped at a local granite company and said he wanted to build a strange monument almost 20 feet high. The next year, that monument was unveiled. It's commonly called the Georgia Guidestones, and on it are inscribed 10 principles for the future guidance of humanity. Some call the Guidestones America's Stonehenge, and many are deeply suspicious of the monument. Some link it to witchcraft, the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, the Illuminati, or the New World Order. The Ten Principles inscribed on it have been called the Ten Commandments of the New Age, or even the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. So what's the truth about this monument? Why was it built, and who was the mysterious man that commissioned it? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin? The Georgia Guidestones are an interesting and controversial mystery, and there's a lot to say about them. So much, in fact, that this will be a two-parter. Today, we'll give you the background to the Georgia Guidestones and consider the mystery from the reason perspective. Then next episode, we'll reveal the identity of the man who built them and look at the message of the Guidestones and the controversial question of whether it's in conformity with the Christian faith and whether these really are the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. All right, let's start by talking about where the Georgia Guidestones are located. Obviously, they're in the state of Georgia, but where are they more specifically? They're in the north part of the state in Elbert County. They're located on a hill nine miles north of the county seat, which is the town of Elberton. The town was settled in 1780, and it's not very big. In the 2010 census, only 4,600 people lived there. The town refers to itself as the granite capital of the world because there are major granite deposits there, and the granite industry is very important to the town. Granite is, of course, a stone that's used for making things like countertops, 
tombstones, statues, and of course, monuments. There are several granite monuments in the town other than the Guidestones, and the most famous is a statue nicknamed Duchy. Duchy is a statue of a Confederate soldier that was made in 1898, so a little more than 30 years after the Civil War. The artist was a German immigrant named Arthur Better. Unfortunately, Better did not know what a Confederate soldier looked like, and rather than ask any of the local veterans to show him one of their uniforms, he decided to use his imagination and gave the statue a rather whimsical design. As a result, when it was unveiled, the local populace was shocked to see how goofy and cartoonish it looked. Some said it looked like a cross between a hippopotamus and a Pennsylvania Dutchman, which is how it got the nickname Dutchy. Worse, it had a European-style soldier's cap, not an American one, and worst of all, its uniform looked like that of a Union soldier. The statue was not popular with the locals, so they did what you'd expect them to do, and they knocked it down. Yes, this was a Confederate statue being knocked down because it was not Confederate enough. The locals then buried it face down in the ground where it remained until 1982, though it's now on display lying on its back at the Elberton Granite Museum. But Duchy was not the only local granite monument that was poorly received by the locals. A lot of them don't like the Guidestones either. Who was it that commissioned the Guidestones? In June of 1979, an unknown man drove up to the Elberton Granite Finishing Company, which was owned by a man named Joe Findley. He introduced himself to Findley as Robert Christian. According to the people who met him, he was neatly dressed and middle-aged. He was an older man with white hair and male pattern baldness, and he also spoke with what was perceived as a Midwestern accent, so he wasn't a local. He said that he wanted to commission a monument, and Findlay assumed he wanted to buy a tombstone. A lot of travelers visiting Elberton think that they can cut out the middleman of the local funeral home and pick up a tombstone on the cheap if they go directly to a granite workshop. Findlay explained to him that they were wholesalers and they didn't sell tombstones directly to the public. But Christian said he didn't want a tombstone. He wanted to commission a monument for the conservation of mankind. And he wanted a huge one, something bigger than had ever been attempted in Elbert County before. When he described what he wanted, Finley gave him an estimate for a huge price, which in modern dollars would be in the hundreds of thousands. And Christian didn't blink. He didn't even say that he'd check with some of Finley's competitors to ask for other bids. Instead, he asked for the name of a bank so that he could go arrange the transfer of funds. Finley gave him the name of both banks in town, and soon Christian was on his way. Across town, the president of Granite City Bank, Wyatt Martin, was dealing with ordinary business when one of his employees who was working on payrolls asked him if he could speak with a visitor that had just shown up. The man introduced himself as Robert Christian, but clarified that that wasn't his real name. He called himself Christian because he was, himself, a Christian by faith. In fact, he said he was the representative of a, quote, small group of loyal Americans who believe in God, close quote, and that this group wanted to put up a monument to, quote, leave a message for future generations, close quote. If Christian wasn't his real name, how was he going to pay for the monument? Was it going to be an all-cash transaction? No, he told Martin that he wanted to wire the money to Martin's bank and then have Martin make the payments when the Granite Company and other local companies required them. As the two men got to know each other, Martin became comfortable enough to agree to Christian's plan, but only on the condition that at least he, Martin, knew Christian's real identity. Was it something he had to do for legal or regulatory reasons? I haven't been able to determine that. It 
would not have been necessary for Christian to reveal his name just to transfer funds to the Granite City Bank. The funds, you know, may have been held in accounts elsewhere that were business accounts or trust funds that didn't have anybody's personal name on them. And apparently there were a number of different accounts that they wired money from because Christian wanted the money coming from different sources so that it would be hard to trace. The accounts, you know, might not have had any personal names on them. They might have been called things like the Great Monument for the Conservation of Mankind Trust or things like that. However, it may have been necessary for Christian to reveal his true identity in order to open an account to receive the funds. I don't know what the regulations were in 1979, but certainly today in America, you have to show your ID and more than one form of ID to open a bank account. I suppose that one way around that would be to not open a new account, but to transfer the funds into an existing one. For example, Christian could have asked that the transfer of the funds go into an account owned by Mr. Martin, but that would require a really high level of trust between the two. I know I would be quite suspicious of some kind of setup or at least of future problems if a secretive person wanted to contract with local businesses for large sums and then use an account of mine as a transfer medium. In any event, Christian was willing to disclose his identity, but he had a condition himself. Martin must never reveal his identity to anybody. And Martin agreed not to. Once they had the method set up for transferring funds, how'd they go about selecting the site for the Guidestones? Christian knew that he wanted to have them built in Georgia. He would had done his military training in Georgia, and he had fond memories of that. Also, his grandmother apparently had lived in Georgia. But he originally wanted to locate the monument in another county further south in the state. The reason was that the Guidestones would be aligned with the sun in certain ways, so you could use it to determine the dates of equinoxes in the spring and the fall, and the alignment would be a little bit better further south. He had even hired a small plane and done some overflights of the area where he was thinking about. He also wanted the Guidestones to be in a fairly rural area, not in the middle of a city or town. And he wanted them built on a hill that was not overgrown with trees or shrubs so that they would be visible from a distance. That would have been harder in the county further south, which was heavily forested. Meanwhile, the enterprising locals in Elberton wanted to see all of the money spent in their own county and they were intrigued by the idea of getting a local tourist attraction out of the deal. So they convinced Christian to build it nine miles north of town on land that was owned by a local cattle rancher named Wayne Mullinex, who was involved in other aspects of the project. Christian bought five acres of land from Mullinex, and he also gave his family cattle grazing rights for two full generations, so the cows would keep the property from getting overgrown, for more than a century. It would essentially be a livestock-based lawn mowing service. After the property had been purchased, Christian then had Martin deed it over to the county because he said that the county would likely be the longest-lasting, or at least one of the longest-lasting, institutions in the country. It sounds like he was expecting some kind of disaster that would destroy other institutions. Indeed, and that wasn't unreasonable, as 1979 was back in the Cold War and the threat of nuclear war with Russia hung over us all the time. The fact that he said he wanted the monument to help with the conservation of mankind also fits with the idea that he was expecting a disaster. He likely reasoned that if nuclear war broke out, many institutions would go out of business, perhaps including the federal and state governments. But there should be some kind of local government, either the current county or its successor. It was later revealed that he hoped the Guidestones would last centuries, and who knows what could happen to institutions in that amount of time. When he first met him, Christian told the banker, Martin, that he had traveled the world and he'd been thinking about a way to help future generations for about 20 years. Given his age, it's quite possible he served as a soldier in World War II and saw the deplorable conditions that were caused by that war. Since World War II was the world's first atomic war, even though there were only 
two bombs dropped, he may well have been worried about what would happen if a full-out nuclear conflict occurred. In the opening for this episode, we heard part of President Truman's announcement of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in World War II, and he was right that more powerful atomic bombs were in development with the hydrogen bombs that came out just a few years later. Since that time, fears of full-scale nuclear war had grown stronger with the tensions between the U.S. and USSR, and since we were now approaching 1980, that meant that Christian had started to get the ideas that would eventually become the monument around 1960. Those concerns might have been amplified when we had a near brush with nuclear war in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, which we'll discuss in a future episode. How'd they go about making the Guidestones? Christian sent them detailed plans for the monument, and the Granite Company and others in Elberton set to work. At the bottom of the monument, there would be a concrete base, which they needed to let cure so that it could hold the weight of the huge stones that would be put on top of it. You can see the Guidestones in the artwork for this episode. The main component of the monument would be four enormous rectangular slabs of granite, 16 feet 4 inches tall and weighing more than 21 tons each. These were so big that they had to be specially cut at a local quarry. They would then be arranged in the pattern of an X with an open space at the center between them. In that open space, there would be placed a square-cut central column, so that if you looked at the monument from above, it would look kind of like an X with a dot in the middle of it. The central column would also be 16 foot 4 inches tall and would weigh almost 10 and a half tons. And it would be freestanding, not attached to the four surrounding stones. Sitting on top of the monument and helping give it structural integrity would be a flat rectangular capstone. The capstone is almost 10 feet long and 6 and a half feet wide, and it weighs more than 12 tons. There are also other pieces of the monument, apparently including support stones that serve as bases for the main ones, but you can't see them because they're underground. All told, the guide stones are 19 foot 3 inches tall, and they weigh 119 tons. But the stones themselves aren't the only thing we need to know about with regard to the monument, because they aren't just stones. They also have some very unique aspects. Some of these are astronomical in nature and were added during the construction of the stones, but there were relatively few of these. More significant were the number of letters that the workers had to sandblast onto the stones because Christian wanted them to have messages etched on them in various languages. However, the public didn't get to see those messages until the monument was unveiled. Let's talk about the unveiling of the stones. When did it happen and what did the public see? The planning and construction of the monument took almost a full year and the unveiling happened on March 22nd, 1980. The unveiling was a literal one, meaning that the guide stones were covered by a huge dark veil, but when they pulled it off, the public got its first look at the monument. In attendance were several hundred people, many of whom were locals who had been workers on the project as well as their families. Robert Christian did not seem to be in attendance, at least as far as is known, but he sent a statement which was read at the event. It explained that Christian's group feared the possibility of nuclear war and that they hoped that if that happened, the monument would help future generations rebuild and help humanity govern itself wisely. When the public got its first look at the inscriptions on the guide stones, what did they see? Well, let's start at the top of the monument. Each of the four sides of the capstone has an inscription in one of four ancient languages. The languages were Babylonian, using wedge-shaped cuneiform script, classical Greek, Egyptian in hieroglyphs, and Sanskrit. The people in attendance probably couldn't read those, but there was a nearby granite slab on the ground that explained what they said. In the four classical languages, the inscription read, Let these be guide stones to an age of reason. 
So the capstone expressed the fundamental purpose of the monument. It was to provide guidance toward an age of reason that Christian hoped might afterwards follow if a nuclear war occurred, presumably as an alternative to, oh, great, another age of barbarism and war. Below the capstone, there were the four main rectangular slabs. Each of these had two sides, so there were eight sides total. On each side was written a message in a different major world language. The languages were English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, traditional Chinese, and Russian. And you'll notice that these languages are geographically diffused throughout the world. English is spoken in much of North America, as well as the British Isles, Australia, and New Zealand. Spanish is spoken in much of Latin America, as well as Spain. Swahili is spoken in Africa. Hebrew and Arabic are spoken in the Middle East. Russian is spoken in Russia. Hindi is spoken in India. And Chinese is spoken in the Far East. The languages are also based on people who could likely be involved in a world war. English, Russian, and Chinese were the languages of the three superpowers of the time that had lots of nuclear weapons. And Hebrew and Arabic were the main languages in the Middle East, a very volatile region where a major war could start. What did the message on the stones say in these languages? It contained 10 pieces of advice for future generations. The English version of it read, 1. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. 2. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. 3. Unite humanity with a living new language. 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. 5. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. 6. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. 7. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights with social duties. 9. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. 10. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. We'll be considering the implications of each of these pieces of advice. You mentioned that the guidestones had astronomical features. What were those? The explanatory granite slab on the ground near the guidestones explained them. First, there was a long, thin hole through the central pillar that allows you to get a sighting on Polaris, the North Star. Second, there's a horizontal slot in the central pillar that corresponds to the annual movement of the sun, allowing you to determine the date of the spring equinox and the autumnal equinox. Third, there's a channel through the capstone that lets you determine midday or noon or 12 p.m. throughout the year. Were there any other messages the people got when the guidestones were unveiled? The explanatory granite slab on the ground also recorded the physical dimensions of the stones, their size and weight. It also contained a brief reference to Mr. Christian that simply said, Author, R.C. Christian, a pseudonym. This made it clear that Christian was the author of the text on the guide stones and that Christian wasn't his real name. The slab also mentioned those who had paid for the monument, stating, Sponsors, a small group of Americans who seek an age of reason. Finally, the slab had a couple of lines that referred to a time capsule. These said that the time capsule was placed six feet below this spot on to be opened on. Now, as you'll notice, both of those statements trail off with no indication of the date on which the time capsule was placed or on which it was to be opened. That has led to controversy about whether the time capsule ever was placed below the slab. What was the reaction of the public to the monument? It depends on who you're talking about. Many of the locals had participated in building the monument and were hoping for the community to get a tourist attraction out of it. So these people didn't have a problem with it, at least initially. But the air of mystery surrounding the monument started to attract people that the locals regarded as weirdos. <laughs> even, even though the monument made absolutely no references to witchcraft or Satanism, rumors started spreading that witches and Satanists were frequenting the monument at night, and the locals started seeing strange lights. 
out at the monument at night. When they investigated, they found that people had climbed on the stones and put candles on them, apparently used in rituals of some kind. There also were occasional graffiti that defaced the stones, including upside-down five-pointed stars in imitation of pentagrams and declarations of allegiance to pagan gods. The message on the stones that referred to population control and guiding reproduction and uniting humanity in various ways also led other people to be concerned. Some thought that these could signal the involvement of a hidden group like the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians or the Illuminati, all of whom we'll discuss in future episodes, or the Bilderbergs, who we discussed back in episode 47. Others thought that the messages pointed in the direction of a sinister New World Order that might be connected with the end times. That's what led some to call the Ten Pieces of Advice on the Stones the Ten Commandments of the New Age and the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. With people, including local people and Christian pastors, viewing the stones in such negative terms, it's no surprise that the monument has been periodically defaced over the years. You mentioned that the explanatory granite slab on the ground next to the monument mentioned a time capsule that may not have been placed. Are there other elements of the project that may not have been realized? Yes, the group that commissioned the Guidestones hoped to add more slabs to the monument. The plan was to add additional circles of stones around the main monument with the same ten guidelines translated into additional languages. They discussed these plans with various people, but it turned out that they didn't have the money to complete the project. They therefore tried to do some fundraising, but apparently they weren't able to get enough funds and no additional stones have been added. If Christian and his associates have remained anonymous, have they given any additional insight into the Guidestones? Yes, in 1986, Christian published a book called Common Sense Renewed. The title of the book is a reference to early American patriot Tom Paine's book Common Sense. Tom Paine also was the author of the book The Age of Reason, which is a phrase that appears on the capstone of the monument. Christian's book, which is a little more than 120 pages long, goes into his philosophy and the reasons for the Guidestones in great detail. Copies were sent to every member of the U.S. Congress as well as other opinion leaders. Has there been any word from Mr. Christian since 1986? Not publicly, but he and the banker, Wyatt Martin, kept in touch, exchanging personal letters about their families about once or twice a year until Christian's death. In 2015, the evangelical production house Adullam Films released a documentary about the Guidestones called Dark Clouds Over Elberton. The documentary contained footage of an interview with Martin that was recorded in 2010, and in it he revealed that Christian had died several years before, but after the year 2000. That would suggest that Christian's death occurred sometime between 2001 and 2006. However, Martin has consistently said that he would not reveal Christian's identity and that it was a personal matter for Christian's family, even after his death, and that he himself would take the secret to his grave. Despite that, Christian's identity has now been discovered. Before we get to that, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Jacob H., Laura C., Jody S., Sonia C., and Stephen Y., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. Now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron, thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter. When you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 a month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all our shows, including this one, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. 
and by Mysterious Tales of Loss and Woe and Other Jovial Stories, a new book by Truist Dunkworth. In a world of wonder, this is a book that encourages teens and preteens to think and be surprised. Look for it on Amazon.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the Georgia Guidestones? From the reason perspective, there are a number of mysteries to look at. What is the Guidestones' basic purpose? Why does the monument have the astronomical features it does? Do the Guidestones represent some sinister, possibly occult society or conspiracy? Why did the backers choose to stay anonymous? And who was Robert Christian? From the faith perspective, we'll need to look at the ideals expressed on the Guidestones and how compatible they are with the Christian faith. The last two mysteries, Christian's identity and the meaning of the inscriptions, will be the subject of our next episode. For now, what can we say about the Georgia Guidestones from the reason perspective? What's their basic purpose? The basic purpose is straightforward. They're meant to encode a message that would be useful for future generations. That message was shaped in the 20 years between 1960, when Christian got the idea, and when the monument was unveiled in 1980. It reflects the concerns that were common in that age. One of the big fears was nuclear war. That's why the monument is made of granite, so that it can endure for a long time. It's also why it's located in a rural area, away from likely targets in a nuclear war, and it's why the message is in multiple languages, in case the people who find it and seek to learn from it, possibly hundreds of years from now, don't speak English. Another big concern at the time was overpopulation. One of the best-selling books of the period was The Population Bomb by Stanford University professor Paul Ehrlich and his wife Anne. It was released in 1968, and it predicted that overpopulation would lead to a worldwide famine in the 1970s and 1980s, as the global population outstripped the world's ability to produce and distribute enough food for people. It also predicted ecological disaster caused by overpopulation. So, with nuclear war, overpopulation, and environmental disaster being the key concerns of the period leading up to the Guidestones, it was no surprise that its backers wanted to construct the monument to help with the conservation of mankind. They wanted to help future generations rebuild in the wake of the disasters they feared and to help them avoid making the same mistakes they saw our generation is making. Why do the Guidestones have the astronomical elements they do? They give key reference points that you need to rebuild navigation and timekeeping in the wake of a nuclear war. By incorporating the hole that lets you sight Polaris, the North Star, the Guidestones would allow survivors to determine the direction of north and thus reestablish the four cardinal points of the compass. By incorporating the slot that lets you sight the position of the spring and autumnal equinoxes, it would let you reestablish an accurate solar calendar for the year. And by incorporating the hole in the capstone that lets you track the time of noon throughout the year, it would allow you to reestablish an accurate timekeeping throughout the day, or the clock. Between these features, you could redetermine both the compass and timekeeping, including the annual calendar and the progression of time during the day. So we have the Guidestones trying to help future civilization rebuilders with the compass, the calendar, and the clock. Personally, I'm a bit skeptical of the need for all this, as the ancients were aware of all these things and you didn't need a monument to help you with all of them. For example, you could use Polaris or another North Star, because it changes over time, to determine th the direction of North without any physical structure at all. And... A simple upright stick will help tell you when the sun is directly overhead and thus when noon is. But, you know, incorporating these elements for future generations wouldn't hurt. Do the Guidestones represent some sinister, possibly occult society or conspiracy? There's been a lot of speculation about this, and a lot of it is without basis. If you look at the evidence found in the monument itself, or in Christian's book Common Sense Renewed, where he explains himself, there's just no basis for these claims. For example, there's nothing occult about the Guidestones. Its astronomical features are just that, astronomical, not astrological or mystical. 
They're meant to help the survivors of nuclear war reconstruct the compass, the calendar, and the clock. Once you understand that, and when you examine the contents of the book, you realize there's nothing connected with this to suggest the New Age movement, witchcraft, or Satanism. It's just not there. Neither is there any way to link to the Illuminati, who were a historical group founded by Adam Weishaupt in 1776 and who we'll be discussing in the future. There's nothing linking the Guidestones to the supposed New World Order that a conspiracy is allegedly trying to establish. In fact, the Guidestones are designed for an age after civilization crashes and thus after any attempts to establish an imminent New World Order have failed. Neither is there anything on the monument or in the book advocating a new future messianic leader like the Antichrist. Some have claimed that when the Antichrist comes, he'll advocate policies like those found on the Guidestones, but that's entirely speculative. The fact is, we have virtually no idea what policies the Antichrist will advocate other than worship me. And no matter what policies the Antichrist may have, things like them are certain to have been advocated by some groups in history. So you could accuse anybody of advocating policies that will one day be advocated by the Antichrist. Unless those people are today advocating some kind of coming messianic world political leader, you just have no reason to link them to the Antichrist. And the Guidestones don't do that. In fact, they convey the impression of not having any idea who might be ruling after a nuclear war. The backers hoped that the local Georgia county might survive. And the fact that the Guidestones contain a message in eight major languages strongly indicates that they have no idea who might be able or inclined to respond to the message of the monument after the disaster. So, no, there's no indication that they envision a coming messianic world political leader like the Antichrist. Are there any secretive organizations that we have evidence for that might have a link to the Guidestones? There are two. First, there's the Freemasons. It has been pointed out that various people in the Georgia granite industry who were involved in building the Guidestones were members of the Shriners. The Shriners are a Masonic group, but we're not talking about the let's destroy the Catholic Church type of Masons you might find in other centuries or in countries like Mexico or Italy. Instead, we're talking about the 20th century American we're a bunch of Southern good old boys who happen to have a goofy men's club Shriners. In fact, in many towns in the American South, the local Masonic Lodge is the main men's club, and it's largely an excuse to get together. To give you a sense of what they're like, here's how the Shriners describe themselves on their official website. Shriners International is a fraternity based on fun, fellowship, and the Masonic principles of brotherly love, relief, and truth. They do things like hold soapbox derby races and have members serve as clowns in local parades or in a Shriner's circus. They have ideas and practices that aren't all in ha harmony with the faith, but this kind of Shriner Mason is basically a goofy good old boys club, not an organization bent on world domination. However, there are much more dangerous types of masonry, which we'll talk about in future episodes. Also, we're only talking about some of the local granite workers in Georgia being masons. Not everybody involved in the project was. For example, the banker, Wyatt Martin, was not a mason. Neither, so far as the evidence we have, were Robert Christian or any of the backers. In fact, masonry is not even mentioned in the book Christian wrote to explain the Guidestones, and the book doesn't contain distinctively mas Masonic ideology. There are things like believing in God is good and we ought to be tolerant and run the planet in a reasonable way, but those aren't distinctively Masonic ideas. In fact, the Guidestones are primarily concerned with things like overpopulation and ecology, which, so far as I've been able to establish, aren't really part of Masonic ideology. You mentioned there's another shadowy group that people have speculated is behind the Guidestones. Who's that? The Rosicrucians. Like the Masons, they're an organization that claims to be older than they are. 
uh, and we'll talk about them in the future. The legendary founder of Rosicrucianism is a figure called Christian Rosencruz, who is sometimes called Christian Rose Cross. And here's where some have tried to connect them to the Guidestones. Since Robert Christian sometimes identified himself as R.C. Christian, some have speculated that this might be code for Christian Rose Cross or Christian Rosencruz. However, that's just a guess based on a purely verbal similarity, and we don't have any evidence that Robert Christian was a Rosicrucian. As before, he doesn't mention Rosicrucianism or distinctively Rosicrucian ideas in his book. In fact, Rosicrucianism has a lot of mystical, esoteric ideas, and those are most definitely not in the book, which takes a non-sectarian approach. Consequently, Robert Christian and the other backers appear to be what they said they were, a group of Americans who believe in God, led by a man who identified as a Christian and who were concerned about nuclear war and overpopulation and how to help mankind rebuild in the wake of that. Why did the backers of the Guidestones choose to stay anonymous? According to Wyatt Martin, one of the reasons was to help detract attention to the Guidestones. If they simply announced themselves, the Guidestones would be less interesting to people, and an air of mystery about them would encourage more people to learn about them and maybe take their advice seriously. However, in Common Sense Renewed, Robert Christian mentions a different reason. He says, I am the originator of the Georgia Guidestones and the sole author of its inscriptions. I have had the assistance of a number of other American citizens in bringing the monument into being. We have no mysterious purpose or ulterior motives. We seek common sense pathways to a peaceful world without bias for particular creeds or philosophies. Yet our message is in some areas controversial. I have chosen to remain anonymous in order to avoid debate and contention. Our guides must stand on their own merits. So, he said he wanted to remain anonymous because he didn't want the hassle of debates and contention over the ideas on the Guidestones that some would and did find controversial. So, Jimmy, what is your preliminary bottom line on the Georgia Guidestones? The Georgia Guidestones are an interesting and enigmatic monument. However, their fundamental purpose is clear. They aren't the product of a sinister or occult group like the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians or the New World Order. They are designed to help mankind reboot civilization in the event of a nuclear war or other planetary disaster. But there's still lots of mystery we need to examine, including who Robert Christian was and what the inscriptions on them mean. Jimmy, as folks prepare for our next episode, they might want some further resources. What resources can they start with? We'll have a link to a book called The Georgia Guidestones, America's Most Mysterious Monument. Also, the documentary, Dark Clouds Over Elberton, The True Story of the Georgia Guidestones. We'll have a link to an article on the Georgia Guidestones themselves and a link to where you can read Robert Christian's book, Common Sense Renewed, online. All right. And then we'll continue our discussion of the Georgia Guidestones next time. But first, we promised that we'd talk about in our Mysterious Feedback segment, our recent discussion with our listeners of their most popular, their most favorite episodes of 2020. Yeah. So what we did was we asked our listeners on Patreon and YouTube and Facebook back in January to name their top three favorite shows from 2020. And we gave them a list of of shows just to remind them of all the things we covered. We got 201 responses, or I should say responses from 201 people, which means one Saturday morning I had more than 600 votes to tally. (laughs) Interestingly, and I'm really pleased with this, every episode of the year got at least two votes. So every episode was in somebody's top three. And none of them were left out of everybody's top three. And that kind of goes along with something I heard a, a, a story a number of years ago about if you reach a certain number of listeners or readers, what you've done is going to be somebody's favorite. And the number is actually smaller than you'd expect. But I was really heartened to see that everything we did was in somebody's top three. Here are the ones that ended up in the top 10. 
Now, we actually have a tie for the number 10 slot. At number 10 are both Young Earth, the three-part Young Earth series, which got 22 votes, and also at number 10 is the Penetration Ingo Swan's Remote Viewing of Alien Moon Bases, also with 22 votes. Moving up to the number 8 slot, since we had a tie at 10, that covers both 9 and 10. Moving up to the number 8 slot, Desperate Coup in Japan, the Kujo incident, with 25 votes. Moving up to number 7, America's Dyatlov Pass slash The Boys from Yuba City, with 25 votes, so that was another tie. Moving up to number 6, The Akita Apparition in Akita, Japan, with 27 votes. Moving up to number five, Exposing FBI Secrets slash 1971 Burglary with 29 votes. At number four, Ruby Ridge with 33 votes. At number three, Remote Viewing with 38 votes. At number two, Wizard Clip with 48 votes. And at the number one position, David Koresh Waco Siege with 84 votes. So a lot of really great topics in there. I was fascinated by the fact that at least half of these, depending on what you count as popular, at least half of these were unlikely to be known by the listeners beforehand. You know, most people have not heard of Wizard Clip or the 1971 FBI burglary or the boys from Yuba City or the coup in Japan, or Ingo Swan remote viewing moon bases. So most of these, for most of the listeners, would be very unfamiliar. And nevertheless, they ended up as among the listeners' most favorite episodes of the year. And that just goes to illustrate how, you know, I don't want to do a mystery if it's not going to be interesting for people. Even if it's one that you've never heard of, it's going to be a good it's going to be a, a good story and have good information in it. Dom, did you have any thoughts about uh, the feedback we got from the listeners this year? Well, jumping off of what you just said, you know, this list only covered 2020, but going back to our earlier episodes in 2018 and 2019, I think anecdotally the most popular episodes in those years were also things that people were unlikely to have heard of before, like the Beth Sphere and Skinwalker Ranch. So that really bears out. I think I really enjoy, and I think people really enjoy, hearing about new, interesting stories of things. But they also want to hear about, as we get feedback from people, things that they they will have heard about, like Bigfoot or Roswell. So Or Akita or David Koresh. Right. I like that mix. Another thing that, that uh, is interesting to me is in that top five, three of the top five, are things having to do with government... Uh, malfeasance? Malfeasance is the mm. word. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, which in 2020 probably is is, is somewhat topical, I guess. But uh, it's, it's interesting to see that, that people really wanted to hear about those historical episodes of uh, government malfeasance in sort of getting to the bottom of those. And maybe a little bit how... Maybe things are a little bit better than they were back then. But I just thought that was interesting that those all appeared in the top five as well. Yeah, we also have a nice mix of normal and paranormal things. Mm -hmm. Because David Koresh and Ruby Ridge and the FBI and the boys from Yuba City and the coup in Japan, those are all historicals. They're mysteries, and their mysteries are involved in them, but they're all normal rather than paranormal. Then on the flip side, we have Wizard Clip, Remote Viewing, Akita, and Penetration as paranormal. And then Young Earth is a science one, mm -hmm. and a science and faith. So there's a nice topical mix there. Interestingly, and I, I contacted the estate of Ingo Swan, who I've interacted with some on Twitter, and they've been very nice. But I contacted them and let them know that Ingo made our top 10 list twice in 2020, <laughs> because not only is he the central figure of penetration, he's the central figure of the remote viewing story. Right, right. And then also, uh, Wizard Clip, Akita, and Young Earth are all faith-related as well. So those were yeah. up there as well. So, uh, yeah, it is very interesting to see. It's, it, I think it, it, it speaks well to the mix that we're really going for in the topics that it's such a spread that people really enjoy the, the, the breadth of what we're doing. And that's that's gratifying. Yeah. And that's something I think about consciously every month when I'm looking at what are we going to do this month? I try to ensure a mix. So there's something for everybody. Excellent. Excellent. 
So let's look forward to 2021, whether uh, what the list will be like. I think it's something we should start doing every year now and, and sort of yeah. surveying the audience. And if you want to take part in this uh, in 2021, make sure that you're following us on Facebook or or on YouTube or which would be even best would become a patron and, and give your opinion there too, as well as getting all the other benefits of being a patron. All right, let's move on to our mysterious headlines. Uh, Jimmy, what mysterious headlines do we have? Well, since we talked about the Guidestones, I thought we'd have a little bit of a Guidestone-related theme for our headlines today. So there are a bunch of planetary disasters that could cause us to need something like the Guidestones. One of them would be an artificial intelligence apocalypse. And there's a new study out suggesting that a superhuman AI would be uncontrollable that there is, you know, there have been people who said, oh, we know we could build one in such a way that it'll be friendly and I'll only do what we want. And it's like, yeah, not, maybe not so much. Maybe <laughs> you don't want to build this. And so we'll have a link to a story for the study, talking about the study that suggests, no, the it really would not be possible to build a superhuman AI that we could control. Also, speaking of the Guidestones as America's Stonehenge, we have a link to another article on why was England's Stonehenge built? And there is some mystery connected with this. Now, obviously, we're going to be doing Stonehenge in a future episode. A couple of things they mention in the article, and I was already aware of, I've taken a course in ancient astronomy. And based on that, we've been able to actually figure out a good bit about Stonehenge. It seems, so number one, Stonehenge is a, a high-class cemetery site. Upper class people got buried there for centuries, or at least their cremains did. And it seems that there was a big annual festival at Stonehenge, but not in the spring. Instead, at the winter solstice. And we have at nearby sites, we have all these pig bones from pork feasts that they would have and people would come from all over. And so it looks like Stonehenge is actually associated as a burial spot and with the winter solstice in particular. But you can read some about that in this article and we'll also have more about it in our future episode on Stonehenge. Excellent. So that just about does it for this time. We want to hear about your theories about the Georgia Guidestones and what we've talked about so far. And if you have some insight into what we will be talking about, you can let us know online by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next episode, we'll reveal the identity of the mysterious Robert Christian and go inside his mind to learn the true meaning of the inscriptions that have been called the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. Excellent. Folks, if you've not yet done so, please subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube at the SQPN YouTube channel where you can hit the bell to get notifications. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>